Washington, D.C. is not only the capital of our nation, but is also one of the most exciting places in the country for anyone interested in history. So many fascinating buildings and monuments are to be seen there. So many important events took place there that one can almost hear the voices of the legendary figures who built up this country. It would be hard to compile a list of all the interesting sites there, but certainly high on my list would be the National Archives building in downtown Washington. There in the rotunda, a visitor will be able to view the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and a very significant document known as the Declaration of Independence. As every school child knows, this parchment is just what it claims to be, a declaration to the British that the American colonies were to be independent of their rule. Much myth, much legend, and much false history surrounds the story of its signing, but eventually 56 signatures ended up on the declaration. The oldest of the signatories was 70 years old, the youngest 26. Some were born here while some came from abroad. One signer later recanted, while a couple of others later became president. But the most recognizable signature on there, the largest, the boldest, and arguably the most beautiful, belongs to a man who is strangely not all that well known except for his signature, a 39-year-old merchant and smuggler by the name of John Hancock. So recognizable is his flamboyant signature, in fact, that in this country the term John Hancock has become synonymous with the word signature. I just need your John Hancock here on this line. Why did he make his signature so big, so bold, so beautiful? Legend says that after signing it, he remarked, There, I guess King George will be able to read that. Of course, like many such legends, it is just that. We often hear that he was being ostentatiously courageous, knowing that his life was now on the line and wanting to give to his compatriots an example of bold defiance. Others have spent much time and energy analyzing the handwriting in an attempt to determine the extraordinary personality that must have produced it. Well, the less colorful truth is that back in those days they did not provide digitally produced or even typewritten dotted lines with the threatening instructions, sign and date here, and if you do not stay within the lines, the marriage license will be invalid. The truth is, as President of the Congress, John Hancock was the first to sign, and he genuinely did not know how many others would be willing to sign below him in the days and weeks and months to come. He did not know if he had to leave room for two more signatures or, as it turned out, fifty-five. And the even simpler truth is, as historians have discovered, he always signed his name that way. We, too, are called upon to affix our names to so many things, from the credit card receipt to the mortgage documents, from the school registration to the car registration, from the Christmas card to the prenuptial agreement. Our name appears all over. We may never sign anything quite as famous as that document from 1776, but each time we write it, our signature commits us to something. We take on a responsibility. We acknowledge something important. 
How awesome it must have been for the signers of the Declaration of Independence to look at that document in later years and see their own names on it, knowing that those signatures had changed the history of the world. How more awesome still to find our own names really do appear elsewhere, declaring not our independence from anything, but our dependence on someone, our very real and eternal dependence on the one in whom we have our life, our intimate and irrevocable union with God. This declaration of dependence appears the very first time we realize the awesome truth that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. It is renewed each time we open our lips in prayer, each time we open our hearts to another person, each time we open our eyes and see beyond the narrow limits of the private petty world that is our private petty life. It is a recognition, a commitment, a connection. It is celebrated not once a year, but with every breath we take. And it is found not in a national archive, but on our very soul. Do not rejoice because the spirits are subject to you, we are told today. Do not rejoice because of any illusion of independence, riches, youth, or experience. Do not rejoice because you are alive, but rejoice because you are in God, and God is in you. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Put your John Hancock on that.